The arguments for capitalism are pretty straightforward. Yep, it's wrong to initiate force against peaceful people. Forget scientific evidence. Just memorize the vague, baseless presuppositions considered to be so-called common sense, and you'll be fine. <sighs> you know, it's as if I never made the video Libertarianism and Property Rights from First Principles. Link is in the description. We have a solid deontological basis for our viewpoint. Where's yours? Also, gotta love how he says we're the ones who don't like looking at empirical data. In my video, Statists in the Microcosm Fallacy, I show a number of graphs derived from UN and OECD data showing that pretty much every imaginable metric is improved the more economically free a country is. Link to that is in the description too. I'm also linking to a couple of talks from Austrian economist Tom Woods, Applying Economics to American History and Keynesian Predictions versus American History. All of this should make it clear that it's not we who don't like looking at scientific and empirical data. I'll be showing that throughout this video. Who wants to bet this guy won't show any at all, or if he does, it'll be cherry-picked and based on economic fallacies? Let's watch and find out. Number 10. Capitalism Promotes Innovation Ah, right off the bat, I get to use one of the graphs I made. This is an XY scatter plot, the X axis being a country's score on the Index of Economic Freedom, and the Y axis being their score on the Global Innovation Index. The positive correlation between capitalism and innovation is unmistakable and undeniable. So what does this moron have to say about it? A recent poll by Gallup found that only 13% of the 180 million employees in the 142 countries studied felt that they were engaged with the work they were doing. Okay, so what? How does that statistic speak against free market capitalism? All of those countries would have had varying degrees of capitalist and socialist policies. If you want to make the claim that capitalism works against it, you have to do what I did. See if you can find a correlation between your metric and how economically free the country is. You didn't do that. We are more than capable of providing basic education for everybody. But due to global economic inequality, this just doesn't happen. Let's assume you're right about this. Again, how do you blame capitalism for this? Let's look at how capitalism affects income inequality. Measured as the ratio of the richest 10% to the poorest 10% according to the UN's Human Development Report. Notice that this ratio tends to be lower the more economically free a country is, meaning that you get less income inequality with more capitalism. And the same is true with wealth inequality as measured by the Gini coefficient. So if this is a problem, then the solution is more capitalism, not less. If capitalism promotes innovation, why are vast numbers of people being needlessly deprived of the means to innovate? Simple, because there are too many socialist morons like you out there getting in the way of it. Why didn't you even try to look at how different this is between countries that are more capitalist and countries that are more socialist? I'll tell you why, because it would have shown that it's socialism that causes these problems, not capitalism. Not only that, but education under capitalism typically involves destroying creative and critical thought and training people for the mindless obedience of the workplace. Oh, really? Then how come pretty much all of the educational systems in these countries are run by government? You took something the government has pretty much monopolized and blamed it on capitalism. Does it get any more dishonest than this? Well, it just might if we wait. Number 9. Free markets increase economic development. This is false. No, it's not. As you can clearly see in this graph comparing the Legatum Prosperity Index to economic freedom, lower numbers are better, and they get better the more economically free a country is. Again, the correlation is unmistakable and undeniable. The IMF, World Bank, and World Trade Organization shove free markets down the throats of developing nations. Oh, if only that were true. No, these are instruments of hideous government regulations. The IMF is a tool for bailing out failed socialist economies like Greece. The World Bank helps cover massive deficits in developing countries, discouraging fiscal responsibility. And the World Trade Organization is about as anti-free market as you can get, inhibiting free trade and engaging in political interventionism and protectionism. Ron Paul has spoken out against the WTO, as has the Ludwig von Mises Institute. Links are in the description box. Really, you'd be hard-pressed to find a libertarian who likes the WTO. By the way, 
how do you shove a free market down someone's throat? We're gonna force you to do things the way you'd like to voluntarily. Gotta love the weasel words. Why do socialists always have to pretend that a voluntary exchange mutually beneficial to both parties is somehow force? Take Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Yeah, cause those are real hotbeds of free market capitalism there. Despite giving credit to the market, a lot of the technological advancements we enjoy today, such as the internet, actually originated in the state sector. Oh, how many times do we have to debunk this? This time I'll just link to an article by internet and security expert Robert Graham explaining why this is fallacious. Number 8. But aren't markets a rational means of organizing economic life? About a third of the food produced in the world for human consumption every year, that's about 1.3 billion tons, gets lost or wasted. Meanwhile, starvation is rampant. And where is starvation rampant? It's not in capitalist countries. It's in socialist hellholes like Venezuela, North Korea, or many African countries. They're starving because their corrupt central managers won't let food be imported. It's also quite common for businesses to deliberately manufacture things so that they break down faster. Keynes predicted in 1930 that by the turn of the millennium, technological innovation would result in a 15-hour work week. This is technologically possible, so why aren't we working three-hour shifts? We probably could work a 15-hour week if we wanted to live like people did back then, when not many houses had a TV, refrigerator, or central air, and forget about things like computers and smartphones. We decided we'd rather live in resilient stick-built homes, not the brittle cinder block homes they built back then, and have the comforts of central air, a fully stocked fridge, a computer with broadband access to the internet, a modern energy-efficient car, and lots of other things that people couldn't even imagine having back then. Consumers didn't even have their own cameras, generally speaking. The Polaroid wasn't invented until 1937, so how many cameras have you owned? We're working 40-hour weeks because we're getting more benefits for the time we work. Because markets don't let us. Instead, we find hordes of people doing bullshit jobs, the wages of which will most likely be spent on bullshit products that people have to be made to want. Listen to the arrogance of this guy. Like all authoritarians, he's acting like his own subjective opinion is the one true objective fact. But who decides if a job is bullshit? If it's bullshit, why is someone willing to give up some of his money to pay you to do it? And who are you to tell other people that the products they want to buy are bullshit? Rational does not mean doing the things you think they should do. And you cannot make someone want to buy a product. Here's a case in point. New Coke. In 1985, Coca-Cola reformulated their flagship product to a tremendous marketing campaign. If anyone could make the consumers want a product, it's one of the world's biggest companies, and they were putting their all into it. It didn't work. Consumers hated it, and the backlash was tremendous. After only three months, Coca-Cola gave up and reintroduced the earlier formula as Coca-Cola Classic. Number 7 but surely we can prevent bad business practices through ethical consumerism. Businesses can easily get around this. Firstly, the mass media are structured to their benefit. The mass media is in bed with politicians and keep pushing the socialist agenda you're espousing. Again, you're arguing against your own side here. Media corporations make profits by selling audiences to advertisers. They are economically structured to cater to the needs of big business, and as such, they are unlikely to give out information that exposes bad practices. Whereas the free market gives you things like Yelp, and Amazon reviews, and Angie's List, and other reputation systems like what eBay sellers have to worry about. Number 6. Don't government regulations address the question of bad practices? Politicians tend to represent who pays for them, not who votes for them. It's difficult to expect politicians to clamp down on corporations engaging in bad business practices when these very same corporations are the people who pay for them to be there. Oh, so you're admitting it's not a free market. Government in bed with corporations is corporatism, not capitalism. And capitalists, libertarians, anarcho-capitalists, and Austrian economists are soundly against it. Number five, but don't you buy things from corporations? 
Doesn't that make you a hypocrite? This is like saying you can't drive a Volkswagen Beetle without being a Nazi, or that you can't use the Moscow Metro without being a Stalinist. That's fucking asinine. Really? So, you get to deny the benefits of capitalism while enjoying the benefits of capitalism, and it's just asinine because reasons? You were complaining earlier about not having a 15-hour work week. If you think that's so great, why don't you get a job working 15 hours a week and do without your computer, cell phone, refrigerator, air conditioning, TV, and all the other innovations capitalism has given us and made affordable since then? Number 4. Capitalists put risk into their businesses. Surely they should own them. Although mildly challenging at first, this still fails. There's no doubt that the Nazis must have put a vast amount of effort into their actions when rising to power. Wow, little over halfway through the video and Godwin's Law rears its ugly head. Psychopaths like libertarian socialist rants just can't see the difference between forcing your way on people and putting your own money into a business hoping it'll attract customers who don't have to buy from you. One more example of how statism poisons the mind as much as any religion. The fact that an authoritarian may take some degree of personal risk. A business owner isn't an authoritarian, idiot! If you want to see an authoritarian, look in the mirror! In order to exercise power over others. They're not doing that. They're selling a product or service the people want or need at a price they'll agree to. Number three, but living standards improve overall, even for the poor. This is an old chestnut. No, it's established economic fact. If you think it's wrong, then why don't you point to one comparable time period in world history where the economic conditions of the poor and working class increased to the rate that it did in 19th century America? There were improvements in living standards in slave societies. Living standards improved for the Germans under fascism. Living standards improved under Stalinism. But what rate did they improve at? That's the point. Is that an argument for fascism or Stalinism or slavery? No. All of those systems are based on an initiation of force. Capitalism is based on a rejection of that, where the only legitimate transactions are voluntary. The more you ignore this, the more desperate you show yourself for any valid criticism of capitalism. I mean, really, most of your criticisms boil down to capitalism is wrong because Nazis are bad. What? The worker cooperative sector in Argentina is continuing to expand, involving almost 20 million people. People whose lives still aren't improving as much as they are in Hong Kong, the freest economy in the world. Number two, but capitalism is a result of human nature. This is another old chestnut. Humans have existed for 200,000 years, whereas capitalism has existed for 200 years. Wow, really? No one was engaging in voluntary transactions before 1817? The idea that capitalism is somehow written into our genetics is pretty dubious. Funny how when people get together, the only thing they seem to want to do is interact voluntarily, and not to start calling for one person to point guns at another to enforce their own way. Seems you only get that with government. The fact is, ethologists have noticed voluntary transactions occurring in almost every species of primate and even many non-primate species. Some have even been found using rudimentary forms of money, offering up food and difficult to obtain objects in exchange for sex or protection. Almost all of us will act like communists at some point in our everyday lives, simply because it's the intuitive thing to do. Then why do people keep having to impose it by force? Why does Venezuela have a black market for everything from food to currency exchange? Why are people risking their lives in rickety boats to escape socialist countries, but they're not doing the same thing to escape from capitalist countries? We have a need to form into little groups of friends with whom we have communal relations and support one another. Friendship is not communism! Stop lying! And it's not as if we have to be forced to do these things. We do them because they're natural and enjoyable. You're talking about social interaction. You're not in any way describing socialism or communism or Marxism or anything of the kind. And this social interaction is voluntary, which, yes, makes it capitalist in nature. That's what capitalism is. Voluntary interaction. There are numerous scientific studies demonstrating that cooperation is an integral part of human behavior. Yes, which is why you see far more cooperation than competition in capitalist systems.
If competition is so natural, why is there any need to have an education system designed to forcefully nail so-called competitive values into the heads of young children with a natural sense of fairness and justice and teach them to hate each other? It does the exact Opposite! Liar! It was socialists like Edward Bellamy who established our schools to indoctrinate children into socialism. This is a matter of easily confirmed history. All you have are lies! Number 1. Capitalism is the only system that's possible. There is no alternative. If you convince people that capitalism is a completely irrational and destructive system with devastating consequences for humans and their environment, and they've run out of all of their other excuses, this is what they'll come up with. Mr. Strawman, give me a break. It's not there are no alternatives to capitalism, just that the alternatives suck. Like Venezuela, a country with a fertile soil and year-round growing season that was one of the world's biggest exporters of grain. Then a much applauded system of modern 21st century democratic socialism was put into place, and less than 20 years later, starvation. As opposed to Hong Kong, which is basically built on a rock, but in just a few decades of being the world's freest economy, went from a place of slums to a modern powerhouse of commerce. A study published in a journal called Ecological Economics suggested that our civilization is headed for irreversible collapse due to mounting economic inequality and environmental destruction. We've seen how capitalism reduces inequality, now let's look at the environment. Like our other metrics, we see a clear and undeniable correlation between economic freedom and the UN's environmental score. Even when we look at specific indices, like the UN's annual mean PM10 measurement of air quality, we see improvements with economic freedom. The need for social change is very clear, and alternatives are in fact possible. The empirical data that you don't want to look at show that the alternative we need here is capitalism. That's why, yet again, you didn't even attempt to see if it was capitalist or socialist countries who were the biggest offenders here. By alternatives, I do not mean some centrally planned Leninist state. Actually, yeah, you do. You just don't realize it or want to deny it. I mean libertarian socialism. Another oxymoron! In which the workers, not the government, own and control the means of production. That means the workers are the government. Because what do you think would happen when someone who isn't a worker tries to own something? They're gonna come in and use force to stop him. They may as well put on the jackboots right now. In a capitalist system, if you think that workers should own the means of production, then set up your factory to work that way. No one will use force to stop you. What you don't get to do is use force to make other people conform to how you think they should be doing things. But that's exactly what you're talking about. The anarcho-syndicalists of the Spanish Revolution managed to create a working alternative to capitalism, taking the Spanish economy under worker control, expanding the healthcare system, and improving literacy rates. You're talking about a period of three years. It's not difficult to make short-term improvements after a civil war. Even a mere regression to the mean would do that. Things appear to be going well in Venezuela for over a decade, which is why as recently as 2013, socialists from Bernie Sanders to Joseph Stiglitz were pointing to it as a prosperous example of successful democratic socialism. Less than three years later, less than two decades after the great Bolivarian revolution that put Hugo Chavez in power, it all collapsed, resulting in poverty and starvation. That's the thing about socialism. It always looks great at first when you can ride on the coattails of what came before. But then, you start running out of other people's money. And that's when it all starts falling apart, just as Ludwig von Mises described. Hey, this video was created at the request of one of my patrons, Huge Sinker. And if you'd like to request a video for me to do, just become a patron at the $2 level. And if you enjoyed this video, remember to hit like and subscribe. And you can also support this channel by using the links below to donate via PayPal or crypto.